So we've discussed how judicial activists view the Constitution as a living document that needs to evolve as the times change. So, what's the problem here? It seems logical, and most people would agree, that even though the Constitution doesn't mention the right to use contraceptives, that people should have the right to use contraceptives. So what's the problem? Well, this, of course, was not a unanimous decision. Griswold v. Connecticut was decided by a 7-2 to two decision, so there were two justices who said that this decision was wrong. So what was their argument? Well, their argument was a classic articulation of the other mode of judicial interpretation, and that is judicial restraint. And what they said was that the majority fundamentally misunderstands the role of a Supreme Court justice in American democracy. That the Supreme Court in this case was acting more like a legislature than a court. Justice Black wrote, I do not to any extent whatever base my view that this Connecticut law is constitutional on a belief that the law is wise or that its policy is a good one. In order that there may be no room at all to doubt why I vote as I do, I feel constrained to add that the law is every bit as offensive to me as it is to my brethren. So Justice Black begins his dissent by saying, I think this is a terrible law. I think this law is stupid. But I'm voting for it anyway. Why? Privacy is a broad, abstract, and ambiguous concept which can easily be shrunken or expanded in meaning. For these reasons, I get nowhere in this case by talk about a constitutional right of privacy as an emanation from one or more constitutional provisions. I like my privacy as well as the next one, but I am compelled to admit that government has a right to invade it unless prohibited by some specific constitutional provision. So again, this is very interesting. I like the right of privacy, but just the fact that I like it doesn't mean that it's part of the Constitution. The due process argument which the majority adopts here is based on the premise that this court is vested with the power to invalidate all state laws that it considers to be arbitrary, capricious, unreasonable, or oppressive. The power to make such decisions is, of course, that of a legislative body. Surely it has to be admitted that no provision of the Constitution specifically gives such blanket power to courts to exercise such a supervisory veto over the wisdom and value of legislative policies and to hold unconstitutional those laws which they believe unwise or dangerous. So Justice Black is saying here that the court is acting more like a legislature than a court. It is simply saying that it thinks that this is a bad law, that this law is a bad idea. But that is a judgment for a legislature to make. That is not the judgment for the court to make. The court is only supposed to be discussing whether or not laws are constitutional. And in this case, there was no provision of the Constitution that was actually violated. So, people who hold this point of view are called judicial restrainists or strict constructionists and they have certain criticisms of the philosophy of judicial activism that we discussed in the other lecture. First of all, they say it's arbitrary. Um, anytime five justices feel that something's the case, then that's the way it's going to be. For example, um, the death penalty was constitutional in this country until, in 1972, five justices on the Supreme Court said that it wasn't. So for 200 years, the death penalty was unconstitutional, then it wasn't, then it was constitutional again in 1976. So it's arbitrary depending on the whims of five justices on the court. In addition, the criticism of judicial activism is that they have a wrong idea about what the Constitution is. If you'll recall, Judicial activists see the Constitution as a living document. Judicial restrainists do not see the Constitution as a living document. They see the Constitution as a contract. And as with any contract, you can't change its meaning over time. A contract means what it means, and it means what it means and what it meant to those who wrote it.
and that judges are not supposed to be changing the meaning of the Constitution over time, and that many of the decisions that activist judges reach confuse the act of judging for the act of legislating. Whether or not a law is a good idea is different from whether a law is constitutional, and judicial activists, according to judicial restraintists, confuse these two concepts. And as a result, the ultimate criticism of judicial activism is that if it's used too often, it can damage the court's legitimacy. As you recall, judicial activists tend to overturn laws more frequently, and as a result, they are often going against majorities, and when you're constantly thwarting majority rule, as the court did, for example, during the Franklin Roosevelt era, the court's legitimacy can be damaged. And, of course, ultimately, judicial activism, according to its critics, harms democracy. That in a democratic society, important decisions should be made through the regular democratic process. And it's not right if five justices can overturn the wishes of 80 or 90 percent of the American public. Five people are not more important than 200 million people. So again, this is the philosophy of judicial restraint. And individuals who subscribe to this philosophy reject the activist notion that the Constitution embodies dignity, justice, fairness, equality. To them, this is not what the Constitution is about. The Constitution instead is merely a set of rules. It lays down what the government can do and how it goes about doing that. And of course, judicial restraintists acknowledge that justices can indeed overturn laws, they agree with that, but they would do so far less frequently than activists would. And they say that they would only overturn laws based on very specific provisions of the Constitution. So the idea of judicial activists that you can create new rights, such as the right to privacy, is an idea that individuals who subscribe to judicial restraint reject. And they say that if a right is not explicitly listed in the Constitution, it probably does not exist. Now, of course, this seems to contradict the Ninth Amendment, which specifically tells us that Americans have rights that aren't contained in the Constitution, but judicial restraintists are very, very skeptical of creating new rights. And, of course, as we've already mentioned, this leads them to overturn laws less frequently. They tend to defer more to Congress. They tend to defer more to majorities. So then that raises, though, a question, what about awful laws? There are just some laws out there that are really, really bad. Like, for example, the law against contraceptive use. Why should people be arrested for using contraceptives in the privacy of their own home? Can we do anything about that, according to judicial restraint? Absolutely. If you do not like a law, the answer is to vote the lawmakers out of office. And if you do that, new lawmakers will reverse it. So, for example, with Obamacare, if you thought Obamacare was bad, according to judicial restraint, the solution is not to have the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional, but rather to win elections and repeal it. And in fact, of course, that's exactly what ultimately happened with Obamacare. So, Justice Stewart also dissented in Griswold and he summarizes this point very well. It is the essence of judicial duty to subordinate our own personal views, our own ideas of what legislation is wise and what is not. If, as I should surely hope, the law before us does not reflect the standards of the people of Connecticut, the people of Connecticut can freely exercise their true Ninth and Tenth Amendment rights to persuade their elected representatives to repeal it. That is the constitutional way to take this law off the books. So Stewart is saying that we don't have to suffer with terrible laws. There is a way to get rid of them, but that way is through the legislature, not through the court. Well, but what if there's an awful law, 
and it violates something like the right to privacy, a right that should have been in the Constitution, but a right that the Constitution simply doesn't mention. What about the Ninth Amendment? Well, salute conservatives have a solution to that as well. If there is something not mentioned in the Constitution that should be, well, the framers thought of that, and you should simply amend the Constitution. So, judges should not invent the right to privacy. Rather, they should merely uh, uphold the legislative law, and if people want a right to privacy, then they should amend the Constitution. Again, Justice Black, in his Griswold dissent, summarizes this point extremely well. Why shouldn't the Constitution be changing? Why shouldn't it be a living Constitution that changes with the times? Well, Black writes, I realize that many good and able men have eloquently spoken and written, sometimes in rhapsodical strains, about the duty of this court to keep the Constitution in tune with the times. The idea is that the Constitution must be changed from time to time, and that this court is charged with the duty to make those changes. For myself, I must, with all deference, reject that philosophy. The Constitution makers knew the need for change and provided for it. Amendments suggested by the people's elected representatives can be submitted to the people or their selected agents for ratification. That method of change was good for our fathers, and being somewhat old-fashioned, I must add, it is good enough for me. So again, amending the Constitution is the only legitimate way of changing the meaning of the Constitution according to judicial restraints. So, how would judicial restraints interpret the Constitution? We mentioned that judicial activists looked at the Ninth Amendment and they looked at the preamble. How would judicial restraints interpret the Constitution? Well, first, they try to read the text literally, if possible, if they can simply answer whatever question they have by reading the words of the Constitution, then they will do that and stop. That is called textualism. But oftentimes, of course, the Constitution is very vague, and you have to go beyond the meaning of the words. And so if that's true, individuals who believe in judicial restraint say that they should follow the intent of the framers when the text is not clear. This is called the doctrine of original intent, and they say that just like any contract, in figuring out what the Constitution means, we should figure out what it meant to those individuals who wrote it. And so, for example, in the oath, that's why when they were discussing the Second Amendment, they were talking about what the framers meant when they wrote it. Now, just as there are problems with judicial activism, there are serious problems with original intent as well. First of all, of course, is that original intent is often hard or impossible to determine. Of course, you didn't have cameras, you didn't have recordings back then, and the Constitutional Convention was held in secret. Notes were taken, of course, but it's often difficult to tell exactly what the framers meant about particular parts of the Constitution. In addition, many people ask, why should we follow the intent of the framers? Because, of course, the framers were themselves unrepresentative of American society it is, as it is today. Actually, they were unrepresentative of American society even as it was back then. The framers were 55 individuals who were all men, who were all white, and who are all rich. And so nobody else had any input into the Constitution at the time. And one of the biggest problems with original intent, of course, is although we can talk about amending the Constitution as a way to change its meaning, the framers, of course, made amending the Constitution almost impossible. To amend the Constitution requires a two-thirds majority vote in both houses of Congress, which is itself almost impossible, and then it requires the approval of three-quarters of the state legislatures, which is also extremely difficult. Now, to see how the doctrine... The doctrine of original intent was extremely important during the confirmation of Robert Bork to the United States Supreme Court.
If you'll recall, Robert Bork was nominated by Ronald Reagan to the Supreme Court in 1987, and his nomination was rejected. And it was rejected largely because of the argument that he made about Brown v. Board of Education, which was very much an originalist intent argument. So what was Bork's argument? Bork argued that Brown v. Board of Education was wrong. In Brown v. Board, the court decided that the Equal Protection Clause made segregated schools unconstitutional. Bork said that no, segregated schools did not violate the Equal Protection Clause. And he said he arrived at that conclusion because he examined the original intent of the framers of the 14th Amendment. And in fact, he's not the only one. There's a whole book entitled Government by Judiciary that uh, examines this. And if you take a look, uh, what did the members of Congress say back in 1866? That was the year that they proposed the 14th Amendment. So uh, Robert Bork took a look and said, well, what did they say back in 1866 and what did they do? Well, first of all, in 1866, there were specific assurances given that equal, the Equal Protection Clause meant that states would not be forced to integrate their schools. There were speakers that stood up on the floor of the House of Representatives and on the floor of the Senate and they said that this this amendment would never be used to integrate the schools. And then in 1954, the Supreme Court used the amendment to integrate the schools. So in fact, uh, although everybody may agree that this was the morally correct decision, uh, Bork argued that it was legally incorrect because it totally perverted the original intent of the framers. In addition, and this is also compelling evidence, Congress controls the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia is not part of any state. And yet, in 1866, the very same year that Congress passed the 14th Amendment, it also passed a law that required schools in the District of Columbia to be segregated. This is powerful evidence that the framers of the 14th Amendment did not think that it meant that schools had to be seg desegregated because they segregated schools themselves. And so, based on this evidence, he made the argument that the decision was wrong. Now, of course, he said, well, I agree with this particular decision, but it simply was not my role, or it would not be a judge's role, to declare it unconstitutional. And in fact, from his perspective, he was right. If you believe in the doctrine of original intent, it is true uh, that Brown v. Board of Education was wrongly decided. But the problem, of course, is Bork said, well, yes, uh, it was wrongly decided, but I still believe racial discrimination was wrong. And so the answer is, we just need to amend the Constitution. We just need to add a constitutional amendment that says you can't segregate on the basis of race. Well, is that a legitimate solution? Not really. Because, as we've already mentioned, amending the Constitution is virtually impossible as it requires 38 of the 50 states. So that means only 13 states are required to block any amendment to the Constitution. And can you imagine if there was a constitutional amendment to provide equal protection for African Americans and whites? I guarantee you every state of the South would vote against it and they would probably vote against it even today. And what does that mean? If we followed Robert Bork's philosophy, we would still have segregated schools today. So it's a good theoretical point, I suppose, but it doesn't take into account the practical difficulties of amending the Constitution. And, you know, to just say, oh, well, you know, well, we're just going to stick with the law, we're going to stick with Plessy v. Ferguson, or we're going to stick with what they said back in 1866, regardless of how wrong it may be, um, obviously this is a recipe for disaster in a democratic society. You can tell how difficult it is to amend the Constitution because the Equal Rights Amendment back in the 1970s, which would have provided equal rights to women, uh, only got third, it, it got very close, achingly close, uh, 
uh, 35 out of 38 states and then its ratification deadline passed over time it's actually gotten up to the 38 but the ratification deadline passed so it likely will not be added to the Constitution and the ERA had much broader support than any amendment to segregate school desegregate schools would have had and if the ERA couldn't have passed I guarantee you an amendment to desegregate the schools clearly never would have passed and we would still have segregated schools today. And in addition, of course, gay marriage would never happen. The only reason that we have gay marriage is because of a Supreme Court decision. I guarantee you if this were put to the states as a constitutional amendment, you'd get at least 13 states blocking it. So sometimes social change can only be reflected through the court's actions rather than through amending the Constitution. So there are, of course, problems with both judicial activism and judicial restraint. Let me summarize those real quickly. Judicial activism is criticized because it can be arbitrary. Whatever five justices decide is what they're going to do and that it's anti-democratic because five individuals should not be able to overturn the wishes of hundreds of millions. The criticisms of judicial activism is that if you follow this philosophy, the United States would be bound by ancient rules, rules that were set down more than 200 years ago, rules that would never change, rules that become more and more regressive and less reflective of American society as it changes over time.